first of all, Professor, since the webinar's topic is about uh, social semiotics and discourse analysis, I would like to start by asking you to give us uh, some brief definitions of social, social semiotics and discourse analysis. In other words, what is the main focus of social semiotics and discourse analysis? The floor is yours, Professor. Well, we'll take them uh, one by one, start with social semiotics. And so, um, what I usually want to say is that social, I see social semiotics, not so much, I don't want to say what it is, I want to say what you do, I want to see it as a practice, an activity, something that social semioticians do. And there are then three things that are involved. The first one is what we do as social semioticians, we study, um, so we study semiotic resources. We study the, the things that people use to communicate. It can be uh, all sorts of things. That's multimodal. It can be language, but it can also be gestures. It can also be images and so on. We study those, how they you know, try to make a systematic study, the way in which they make meanings, but also want to study how they, um, they're, they're, how they come about in over history and how they develop. For example, in reading images, you know, that is what we do. For to a large degree in reading images, we have uh, laid out a systematic account of the resources that people use when, when they make images. Yeah, one example of that, for example, is the gaze, the look. You know, so in a, in a picture, somebody in a picture, and sometimes also animals or things, you know, if they have eyes, they can look at you or they cannot. If I'm not going to look at you now and I keep talking like this, you're going to be a little bit disturbed. You know? um, but um, some pictures people look at you, some pictures don't. And that has a history. You know, that has a history at a certain point, you know, when, um, when um, sort of in the Renaissance in Western Europe, you know, um, sort of individuality became more important. Suddenly you could see uh, important people in the community looking at you from pictures by Rembrandt and so on. And this idea of the gaze was first established and then it became uh, a common resource for people to use whenever they make pictures with people in it or other things. Second thing uh, we study, how are these resources actually used how are they used in specific context? Uh, how are they used in specific context? And and how is that use organized by people? How is how do they teach the use of it? How do they uh, arrange it? Have they got rules or are they traditions and unspoken rules? And and you know how how are these uses of this resource actually talked about? And is so there. We, we go to a different dimension. Of, and when we say again about the gaze, we can, for example, see that now I'm looking at you, but it is very common if, if, if we done this on traditional television, Nabil would look at you, but I would not, because it's then the anchor people and the journalists look at the viewer, but you, as, a, as a guest, or uh, you cannot look into the camera. That's wrong cannot directly address the audience. That's a rule that is a tacit rule, but it's also a rule that I learned very early on when I went to film school in Amsterdam. You know, that's a particular, but in other contexts, there might again be different kinds of, different kinds of rules about it. So then, uh, the, uh, and sometimes there are no rules, they are just role models. So that's what we study. And thirdly, we also want to study how um, can the semiotic resources and the ways of using them, how can they be changed and how are they changed? So, for example, now when we get new technologies, these practices and these ways of using resources are changing, not the same as what they have been, you know. And we get new kinds of uses of the look at the camera, for example, in selfies, you know, that, that are different from traditional self-portraits or, or art or television. So those three things, you know, studying the resources, the languages that are used in communication, 
studying the way they are actually used in specific contexts and studying also and hopefully participating in changing these kind of things. So we're very keen now on study how new semiotic technologies, you know, um, affect how these resources are being used. And the context, when we talk about social semiotics, it's actually the context, uh, the emphasis on context that makes social semiotics different from other kinds of semiotics. In other kinds of semiotics, people often talk, for example, about how is the signified, the meaning related to the signifier, the, the image or the word or the sound that, that um, puts it across that is audible or visible. Uh, we um, focus very much on, on, the, on the context and we don't say, what does this mean? But what we want to say is, what do people make it mean and how? And how do they organize that? And how do they learn that? And how do they critique it? And so on. People who make meanings. And so we study that in kind of contexts. And of course, you know, the same semiotic resources can mean very differences in different contexts. That's, for example, what is very interesting about color. You know? uh, the color red means different things in different contexts. It can mean danger or it can mean passion. The color green also means very, very different things in different contexts. The sacred color in Islam, but it is also the color of green echo movements. Depending on the context, you know, doesn't quite mean the same thing. But that is very, very important to take into account. About color, you still can often find on the internet lists that say color red means that, green means that. I say to my students, no. Don't use those lists, because they are decontextualized. You have to study this in the context. So that's just a little, little, little thing about um, about what I think doing some social semiotics is. And uh, now we come to and you. You asked me also about discourse, and discourse is actually a little bit of a problematic word sometimes because it has two kinds of meanings that are both very widely used and you've got to keep them separate you know on the one hand uh, this course is used by many linguists you know uh, for uh, a level of language so they say okay you have the level of sounds of speech phonology and then you have the rules that put words that sounds together into words you have the level where words are put together into sentences and then you have the level where sentences are put together into text. And that is full of discourse. But when they speak about discourse rules or discourse, discourse rules or semantics, discourse. And we talk about that's what we talk about. That's what we talk. And now, uh, and now uh, the other uh, meaning is quite, quite different. Is quite different. I actually hear a bit of I feedback at the moment. Is that preventable? Because preventable. Um, I hear myself in echo. That's better. Thank you. Yeah. So the other meaning of the word discourse is uh, different. It is to, um, it means, it refers to a certain way of talking about, a certain way of understanding and representing, and not only talking about, but also visualizing and so on, a particular aspect of the world, what is going on in the world. So, for example, uh, and that means that you could have different discourses, different ways of understanding and talking about different, uh, the same thing. For example, you know, in my book, um, Using Social Semiotics, I give the example of discourses of war. You know, and because with my colleague David Machen, we have written about how wars are represented. You know, so you've got discourses of war, which are all about um, small groups of very skilled professional commandos who go in to uh, fix something, to rescue uh, you know, a hostage or do something like that. And you've got discourses of war that are more about patriotic soldiers defending the country, sacrificing themselves for the country, and so on. And these different discourses can be used in different kinds of texts. You can find the discourse of the commando troops, you know, um, in 
news reports about you know, uh, uh, actions against terrorists, but you can also find them in computer games or in novels, you know, and you can find them in films. You can find them in different media and they can be represented, these discourses, with different means. And the same thing, you know, so um, uh, that, that is one quite different meaning of the word discourse. This is one that is very important in critical discourse analysis. Because in critical discourse analysis, we want uh, to understand, you know, how these, um, what these discourses actually do and how they very often represent certain values and, you know, and how, how they may seek to instill these values, you know, in people through, through the uses of language and other communicative modes. You know? So uh, there are um, the discourse of um, war that involves these professional commando troops, you know, is one that um, often has sort of the values of skills, professionalism, you know, looking after each other and so on, whereas the discourse of war as patriotic defense of the nation, you know, has values like sacrifice and courage and so on. You know. And of course, in critical discourse analysis, we want to, to evaluate those discourses. We want to say whether they are, you know, whether they represent the world, you know, in a way that is uh, productive for um, peace and for equality, or in a way that can be repressive and so on. So uh, that is why that second, uh, of course, we do also then discourse analysis in the first meaning of the word, word because we're analyzing texts, but we also are doing discourse analysis in the second meaning of the word, because we want to know how are things represented. One, for example, one very important part of critical discourse analysis is how are uh, people represented. You know, and I've written about that, worked on a way of analyzing that in tech. That relates to how, you know, that can relate to discrimination, to racism, and to sexism, and to all sorts of, you know, oppression of this. Then we analyze how these, you know, analyze that in particular kinds of text. And that's become very important. And if you look at journals like Discourse in Society, or critical discourse studies, you can see that people do that all over the world and get very involved in because often they are issues, political or issues and social issues that are very important to them. And with critical discourse analysis, gain a better understanding of it. And so that's become a very important form of discourse analysis, particularly over the last 30 years or so.